Hey guys, welcome to Red Dirt Catholics. We've got a bunch of guests today. The last few times, James and I, we've been really lonely. Like it's just been me and you, but now we have we have Archbishop Coakley joining us today. Welcome, Archbishop. And we have Father Jerome Krug, or as I like to call him, Heath Ledger, uh, these days with his beautiful gold flowing locks. The golden locks. The golden locks. Like tell us tell us the story of the hair. Like where did where did when did you decide, you know what? I wanna I wanna have Heath Ledger hair. Yeah. So it's one of those one day at a time kind of decisions. <laughs> I was like, you know, I'm going to skip my every three week haircut that I had, had been getting for five or six years. And yeah. then I went another three weeks and another three weeks. And then uh, pretty soon I kind of liked it and I'm still liking it. So we'll see where it goes from here. It'll go to your shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> I've been arguing. I don't know if it'll get that far. I've been arguing with Peter. He's getting, his hair's getting to the point where it's like getting in his eyes all the time. I'm like, man, it's time to cut it. But he's recently, he watched, um, my, my four-year-old son watched Hotel Transylvania and it had like the Dracula character in it. And he's like, no dad, my hair needs to be long so that I can look like a vampire. And that's, and that's his reasoning. And I'm like, oh, this is, it's one goal. this is great. <laughs> yeah. This is one, this is one thing that we need. Um, uh, moving forward, James, what is your kid's philosophy towards their hair? They, I take them to get haircuts with dad before they are old enough to get a haircut and like get the clippers and stuff. So they'll sit on my lap while I'm getting a haircut. So they usually get pretty excited about it. Oh. Like they mm. kind of opt in at some point, like I want one today. So it never gets too long initially, but Gabriel's 18 months and he's, his hair's, you know, kind of like yours, you know, it's sort of, sort of wavyish up here, but real locky in the back. And it's kind of too cute. I think we're going to keep that for a while. So we'll that's see. exactly that's what... what I'm thinking. Oh, <laughs> 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 well, that's, that's, that's awesome. Um, Father Jerome, you've been running around all day today. Yeah. What's the life of a priest running well, around? It happens to be priest appreciation week, which so, means So you've just been raking in. You've been very appreciative the gifts. Day. I was trying to get some long-term kind of block out 3 hours to just work on some things on my computer, but Friday of priest Appreci appreciation week, it was about every 20 minutes a knock on the door from uh, one of the classes at my office Aww. and uh yeah, it was really sweet, you know. It's the fifth graders bringing their cards or the kindergartners decorated balloons. So right now in my office, there are an abundance of cards and balloons on the floor. It's uh, It's been pretty sweet. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Do you have balloons in your office, Archbishop, right now? No, no balloons. I got... I can I, I can make a, it happen. I did get the a youth, few cards the and uh, thoughtful notes and letters and things, yeah. Yeah, the but youth no office. Balloons. We're we're not above that. <laughs> we can we can we can fill it up with balloons if we need to to appreciate. Oh, he, he <laughs> <laughs> he's like, no, <laughs> do not do that. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thanks thanks you guys for coming on the podcast um, for this week. We're excited to talk about um, the uh, the letter that Archbishop the released letter. this mm -hmm. week. The letter on the unity of the body and soul, accompanying those experiencing gender dysphoria um so archbishop if you could you say a brief prayer as we're shif shifting gears sure. let us pray loving father we ask you to be with us to help us to be aware of your loving presence your fatherly care for all of your children in a particular way we ask you to help those who might be experiencing gender dysphoria to know that they are beloved, that mm. they are beloved sons and beloved daughters. Help us to be attentive to the cries of pain and the need for understanding that is in their hearts. Help us to be attentive to them, to minister to them effectively with truth and charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, we're su we're all super excited by the letter. Whenever I saw it, I knew that it's been happening for for a while. I just like had heard about it, but when I saw it hit my inbox, I was like, "Oh heck yes!" And so read it quickly, and then within a few hours, Father Jerome 
shot James and I in text and was like, when are we doing a podcast about, uh, about this letter? And I was like, Oh, that's a, that's a great idea. We should make that happen. And so it's all been a, it's all been a whirlwind. Um, but Archbishop, just to, just to start off, like what's the story behind the why of like, why, why did this letter come yeah. down? And, well, as everybody is very well aware, uh, there's a, um, transgender ideology that has, uh, or I should say a, a gender ideology that has overtaken our, our culture uh, pretty rapidly and, uh, and it's impacting and affecting uh, so many people, so many institutions uh, um, in our society, in our culture, and certainly in our church as well. So um, one of the things that I was quickly becoming aware of is how this is impacting uh, a lot of the young people in our schools and um, sensing a need for some sort of a pastoral response and some sort of pastoral guidance, actually, not just for um, uh, the young people themselves who might be confused by these uh, these inclinations and feelings and desires and, and messages that they're getting in culture, our culture, but uh, for the parents who are left scratching their heads and, and recognizing the, the, the suffering or the confusion of their children and, and seeking guidance. So... Um, we have, uh, in a certain sense, uh, we're responding to uh, something that's happening in the culture in a way that that is uh, become a great source of, of confusion. And uh, where is the church? What's our response? How can we shed the light of the gospel uh, and bring the uh, uh, understanding of, of the heart of Jesus into these painful situations uh, and offer hope? So that was kind of the, the, the overall sense that something needed to be said, something needed to be done. Uh, I had done a, I'd been asked to do a talk uh, some months ago uh, in another part of the country, and, and I spoke about um, this question uh, in a talk. It was called Transgenderism and the Eclipse of Truth, which was really more of a philosophical and anthropological, theological reflection. Um, and, um, this is something I wanted to be more of a, uh, of a more pastoral nature, uh, mm. having laid out some principles in that other talk. Uh, this is, um, something I hope will be of a s practical assistance to, uh, parents, to, to, uh, pastoral leaders, to, uh, to young people or to anybody who might be experiencing uh, gender dysphoria and those who walk with them and accompany them. Yeah, that's that's absolutely beautiful, and it's and it's very timely, um, with yeah all the things that are happening in our schools and just across the country on, with social media and different things. It's become, it's become something that we need to grow in our depth of understanding because I think for a, a long time, right, like it was just very rare. Like it almost like made you turn your head when you heard it, and like the first time I heard about it, I don't think I even heard about it until I was like in as a teenager. Like it was the first time that I had heard about it. Whereas now I think that uh, your average uh, your average kid's going to be hearing about that and having to understand uh, or ask a question to mom and dad at a much younger age. Um, Father Jerome, how much of how much is that ha has this movement or people who struggle uh, with gender dysphoria been a part of your priesthood or your priestly ministry? Yeah, I think. Um because it's uh, the, the theory, the ideology is something that's becoming more and more prevalent. You're hearing about it more where 10 years ago in 2013, uh, there was very little national discourse over transgender people or gender identity disorder or whatever. Um, but now it seems that everybody has an opinion and a very, very loud and emotionally intense opinion and so I think I hear from different people, whether they're Catholic or, or not, who um, are voicing their very emotionally charged um, thoughts on the matter. And what's interesting uh, that I find beautiful about the pastoral letter is it speaks um, as only the church can into a loud variety of opinions. And, you know, there might be people... Um, you know, who, who think the church has one opinion uh, or has one teaching 
Um, or someone else could think on the totally opposite end of the ideological spectrum that the church has an entirely different opinion. Uh, and so just the necessity of the church to speak the truth um, into all that midst of opinions is, is so helpful uh, because it is something that it seems like everybody has a very formed opinion on. You don't find too many people who are like, yeah, I don't, I don't know what I think about transgender issues. You, you just don't hear that. Mm-hmm. I think that like... I think opinions are becoming stronger and stronger in some ways because of uh, just like the bite-sizedness of information, like within the new culture, like like people are putting, putting entire like movements and ideologies into 30 second sound bites Mm. and videos that are flashy and catchy and make sense or even humorous. Um, And like people hear that and they're like, Makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I like that. That ma- that that makes sense to me. And I think that like the con and you, and if you, you you hear enough of those and you you begin to get reinforced in a lot of different ways and it becomes a, a generic nuance. Um, so I'm excited to dive into this letter with you, Archbishop. And one of the things that I think was foundational, and that's why you started your letter this way towards understanding the the Catholic position, the fatherly position, the loving position that the church has in this area is um, what we believe the human is, and that comes from the uh, uh, our image and likeness being in God and where our identity is at. I was hoping that you'd unpack that a little, or yeah. we could talk about it. I'd like to start even a step before that, the fact that we are created. Uh-huh. Uh, we're creatures. Uh, we don't create ourselves. Uh, we receive uh, our being from God, who has formed us out of nothing, uh, who has created us in his image and likeness, as, as the church teaches, as the um, book of Genesis clearly uh, uh, articulates. So we are created by God. We receive our being from God uh, in his image and in his likeness. And as humans, that means we, uh, uh, we have certain powers of the soul, if you will, that, that uh, like are part of our likeness to God, our intellect, our understanding. Um, it gives us the ability to grasp the truth, uh, our will that gives us the opportunity and the ability to, to strive toward the good, to choose the good, uh, to love. Uh, those are some of the powers of the soul uh, that liken us uh, to, to God, um, that, that is unique to us as uh, as human beings, as human persons, um, male and female. Um, that's part of our uh, way of uh, manifesting uh, the richness uh, and the, the fullness of divine life that is in God. Right. Um, is there, within that anthropology of, that, of being mm-hmm. a created being, we end being the fact that a human being is a, you know, their body and their soul. I think that there's a, we have a tendency to want to separate the two right. or to, or to say that one is more important than the other. Do you guys have any thoughts about that specifically? Yeah. The, I think the letter articulates the point really well. I think it says, um, we don't have bodies. We are bodies enlivened by souls. Yeah. And, and often in my ministry, I don't know, Archbishop, over the course of your, your priesthood, if you've had people say things like, I'm a spiritual being having a physical experience. Somebody said that to yeah. me recently. And I just said, uh, no, you're, you are a physical body. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's really one of the oldest heresies, if you will, mm-hmm. going back to the very beginning, uh, mm-hmm. this, this kind of dualistic notion of... Uh, um, uh, and, and, and this way, this, this Manichaean uh, dis- despising of the, of the physical uh, uh, and in preference to a uh, supposedly superior spiritual self. Um, but those things cannot be separated for us as, as human beings. Uh, we, are, we are embodied persons, um, embodied spirits, embodied souls. One of the things that... Uh, that uh, I always find a. Yeah, I live by the cemetery here, and I will walk often in the in the in the cemetery in the evening. Go for a walk with my dog, and 
you know, I go by the uh, some of the the um, the section of the cemetery, any cemetery that uh, in which small children uh, maybe mm -hmm. have been buried after who died shortly after birth, and they talk about uh, this is my little angel or something like that. So people really miss the point of what it means to be a human being. When we die, we don't become angels. Uh, we are embodied. Uh, we are body and soul, but that's that's who we are. Uh, we are we're human beings. Um, so I think that's a, there's a lot of confusion in, in society in general and even among Christians, believers, and among Catholics about what it means to be a human being, mm. uh, to be body, soul, composite. Uh, it's who we are. It's not one or the other. And so there's not this, you know, universe that exists in which God gives me my soul, but this material experience that I have, this material thing that's encasing me is somehow in any kind of disunity yeah. with the soul that God has given yeah. me, which I think, you know, very many faithful devout Catholics can kind of fall into thoughts like that. Many Christians can, but then also that's one of the underpinnings of uh, the anthropology of kind of gender ideology, mm -hmm. that there's this separation between the two, mm -hmm. that the two are not in unison. They're not singing the same melody, that they can be in disharmony. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. I wonder if there's a, uh, if there's a correlation to like this this hatred for our bodies, like where this, where, the, where these things can come from. And I like, you see it all over the place of just, uh, having an understanding of what the good is, um, and what the good is for our bodies. And like, you know, just commercials are like, are you overweight? That's not good. You shouldn't mm -hmm. like that. Or with makeup, like get conceal and remove and, um, and become beautiful and, and it, it, it's just so often our body is treated like something that is an obstacle towards the good. Uh, or it's idolized. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, right. So mm. it's, it's, not, uh, it's not treated as, it's, as a relative good. It is good. Uh, our physical health is a very good thing, but it's not the ultimate good. Mm. Right. Mm. Um, and, all, and all of these things come from the fall. In, in your letter, you, just, you talk about that um, when Adam and Eve, you know, when Adam and Eve had the first fall, all of these, the, all of these um, ways of uh, rebelling against God and all of these different sufferings came into play, right? Um, in that spot, and we, we seek lesser goods um, as a result of the fall. And like, so we kind of start getting into like the idea of gender dysphoria in this po in, in this place and like what that and what that means and the suffering that comes from that i wonder if we can take a few minutes to like just like hear from you guys of like what does it mean to suffer from gender dysphoria and like and how does the church see that i think well what does it mean to, to suffer from it i mean i think uh it's often expressed in terms of people feeling not at home in their body um that's a, a, a sense of discontinuity or disharmony within the within the self, a, a division within the the, the self. Uh, it's the way people might articulate it. Mm. Uh, and again, as a result of the fall, um, Saint Augustine wrote um, centuries and centuries ago, uh, "Lord, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you." Uh, so that's one way of. We, we all have this, this restlessness, this, this sense of being uh, incomplete. And the, the challenge, of course, is, uh, and the, the, the danger, of course, is when people seek to find their completeness in something that is less than God. Um, that's that's a, 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 tr a challenge, and that's perhaps one of the things that's at play in, in people who are maybe suffering from gender dysphoria or, or any other kind of... Uh, um, sinful uh, inclination or orientation. Uh, we're seeking uh, to find our satisfaction and our deepest contentment in something that can never deliver for us because we're made for, we're made for God. Mm -hmm. I, I think a challenge to all of us Catholics is, I think, to be, 
begin to realize like my first innate response is I have no idea what it's like to suffer from gender dysphoria. Mm -hmm. You know, like I can empathize, but like, and I can see the suffering, but to, to kind of recognize like, I need to know, like if there's someone close proximity to my life, like I need to seek to know them and see them in this place mm. and start to understand that. Um, like the best way I could relate would be with my deepest sense, right? Like, or, or someone else I've walked with who's, you know, it, it's probably very similar uh, to struggle with gender dysphoria as it would be to struggle with a hidden sin a, a hidden desire that I have that I know deep in my bones that mom and dad won't approve of me or my best friend won't approve of me or the priest I admire or teacher I want to impress won't understand or approve of me. Um, like I would invite us as faithful Catholics, like what is the dark part of your heart and life that you struggle to reveal to people around you? You know, imagine if half the world was telling you that that was now your highest identity. Hmm but the part of the world that you treasure these people you share life with might reject you if you let it out that's a, a very hard place to live you know um and i i would challenge us like as catholics we need to learn learn this language mm -hmm. like we need mm -hmm. to come to know it i i think we, we need to be willing to ask that question of like what's happening you know if someone, if someone were to, and even be, the step before that is to like be in relationship with somebody who is struggling in that, in that particular area and have a good enough relationship and show Christ's love and enough in a way where they feel safe and trusted to be, to share that with you. But I think, I mean, I put like, I put myself into this camp as well. Like if I were, if I were to just be randomly given this opportunity to like have a discussion with someone who's really struggling in that area like, I don't know if I have the guts um, or to want to go there, you know, like and, and hear all of that stuff. Like, I'd like to think I would, but there, I think that that's a, that's something that's scary to understand and, or, or to go there with another person of, or to, when it's just easier to, to, you know, be like, well, I know you're struggling with that and I feel really bad for you, but to like actually be willing to listen and to hear yeah. like, what that's like um because the commonality is like we all in our sinful states look for things to fill the void right when we're not when we're not in deep union with the lord like and that's something that we, we can all like mm -hmm. relate to mm -hmm. in in some sense um but uh but yeah but i think that the conversation is a really hard one to have when somebody's like when you're explaining like all of these things about me um, and this whole other half of the world is celebrating me uh, and telling me that I'm treasured and, and, and there's a pedestal there and then the part that's like that I've been in or that maybe even that I know is like some sort of truth uh, is there is uh, I know that it's not in line with that. Like I just can't imagine the the struggle to be real there. You know, as a pause for just a moment, like the, the one, the reason why the movement to the ideology is so successful is there is a truth. You are treasured, right? Right. Like, mm -hmm. and, and even like, even in a sin, we're treasured, maybe especially in a place of sin and woundedness, like in our weakness, we're made strong. So like, I mean, one of the great saints said, you know, our sinfulness is the thing that merits for us Christ's love. Like that ought to be the trophy we hold above our head. So in some sense, like the movement's actually rather attractive because of a, an essential truth. Like the Lord loves you here. You are amazing, beautiful, wonderfully made. And like, we need to be able to move to that type of delight in people in our lives, even if we disagree with, or even if we know that they're celebrating something that's not true because that's true. You are amazing and wonderfully made and beautiful how the Lord made you. Yeah. It's put really well at one point in the letter. It says, a Catholic response means recognizing that all desires are rooted in something good. 
including the desire to identify as the opposite sex, which can be fueled by a wide range of good things, such as a desire for beauty, a desire to be seen as a person and not be objectified, a desire to pursue relationships and activities that aren't culturally acceptable but feel more authentic, hmm. a desire to be seen and known, even though those desires can be misdirected. It, it just puts it in such a, mm -hmm. a stunning clarity that um, the more honest we are with ourselves, no matter what ways we feel restless, um, all the things that we've tried to rest in that aren't in God um, can give us a doorway to empathize with somebody who has probably not chosen, but has at least settled in resting upon a narrative that tells them that their body and their gender doesn't match. And I think that all it takes for us to be able to take an empathetic and truly missionary posture towards the person is to say, I know what it's like to feel restless mm -hmm. and to rest in something that's not God. Uh, and that can be scary. <laughs> like, yeah. like Jace was so honestly saying, and like, I totally agree with that. Um, but you know, we don't overcome things that are hard by understanding them. We overcome things that are hard by simply facing them and realizing that we're still there afterwards. <laughs> you know, we're not just going to, deteriorate or dissolve in hardship we uh we sure. can actually endure through it mm -hmm. and yeah, there's a very real sense in which entering into that struggle and entering that suffering is 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 purifying and and um can bring bring clarity uh as we as we wrestle with those those tough parts of our lives and and sit with others uh, in the uh in the the pain of 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 their suffering i think uh, so we, we can't, we can't get over the, <laughs> we, we, we can't go around the cross. We have to pass through the cross mm -hmm. in, in a certain sense, uh, mm -hmm. to, we have to, to face it head on and, and acknowledge the reality and, um, and trust that the Lord will be with us in the, in that reality. So. So. I want to go around the cross so bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would be that, you know, but that's, that's really real. I love that you, that you stated it that way that like, that's just the way that it is. We have to go through the cross for, for happiness and for that place. And, and I love that in your letter, you did, it just does, it made it very, I think it was the first thing, like when I read it the first time that like was communicated to me, how important it was to separate the suffering um, of the person going through gender dysphoria and the movement that's trying to give the, the opposite movement that's trying to give them a, a completely different answer because they're, they're not the same thing. And I think that it's really, it's, you know, Oklahomans, we're simple people. We'll just lump it all together. If this is, if this is how this person's answering their suffering, then they're, then they must be bad. Um, and, you know, and, and we use aggressive language and, uh, and are uninterested and become closed off to dialogue and are on it, like, and write people off, like James was saying a little bit before. And I think that the letter is very beautifully written in a way of, you know, these people are, are the prize, are infinite value and are welcome here and welcome in our church. Um, and, but there's just a, uh, but there is a difference between them and the movement. I think that that's a really beautiful thing that you got, that you wrote down there. You know, the movement is advancing a distortion, a distorted understanding of the human person uh, that that uh, we don't embrace. We can't embrace because it's, it's a lie. Uh, it's a rejection of our creatureliness. Uh, it's... Uh, claiming to create ourselves by rejecting uh, an essential part of our uh, identity as male or female, uh, as if God somehow made a mistake and, and we're going to to fix God's work. So I think um, I think that's that's an important element to uh, to acknowledge. Yeah, and I think the letter threads the needle so well mm -hmm. 
um, like I was talking about at the beginning, you know, we have so many loud opinions and people might think that the church falls on one side of the opinion spectrum or the other. And the real truth is uh, nobody holds tension like the Catholic Church, mm-hmm. you know, we're the church of both and, um, both loving someone and calling them higher. Yeah. Yeah. God loves us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to leave us the way we are, mm. you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah, if you contemplate the the scene from scriptures of the woman caught in adultery, mm-hmm. which is like very much how I feel the Lord spoke to me in my life is how he spoke to that woman. We could react to the ideology like the ones holding stones. Right. Right, and like have this kind of vigor about it. And what we'll, what we're accidentally doing is making it unsafe to be known if I struggle with sin that's in a hot button area like this. Mm-hmm. Um, but what did the Lord do? He delivered her perfect charity and perfect mercy, right? You know, he, he came to her like, does anyone condemn you? Neither do I. And then he called her to her highest, go and sin no more. Yeah. Invited her to walk in his way. And that's really what we want to share with all of us, not these people or those people. Like that's the, that's the offer Christ gave to humanity, mm-hmm. to, to our brothers and sisters. So if we hold the stone, we're like that sinner. Mm-hmm. If we take Christ's model, we, we bring in one of our own. Right. So one of the, one of the great things about this letter is that like, there's been other things that I've like read from the church before that it says we have to love these people or we have to like care about these people, but it's never particularly pastoral or specific in like how, like, I don't know how, like, I don't, I don't understand it. And I feel like that your letter does a really great job of getting a little bit, at least a little bit more into the nitty gritty of like the life of a parent, for example, Mm -hmm. and how they are to react and some, and you gave some great pastoral guidance on like, what that means. Do you want to mm. talk to us a little bit about that? Well, one of the things, you know, I, I think it's important that as, as for a parent, not to wait until your child is in crisis to begin to show interest in your child, but to, but to mm. really be concerned about having a, a good, strong parental relationship from the very beginning, you know, to be be a part of their life and, and show interest in, in their concerns and, uh, and tenderness and understanding. So I think establishing that that baseline of of trust and love and support uh with young people from the earliest days uh will equip the uh a parent uh to really be present in a in a way that a ch- child can accept that kind of attention and love when when they begin to struggle with something so um being able then to engage in conversation about hard things uh because a son or a daughter knows that they are they are loved and cared for and valued and esteemed by their parent parents so that, that would be just one one practical kind of a thing i think it's important to have good communication obviously but don't wait until a moment of crisis to begin to try to communicate definitely that makes absolute sense i like what I think about I think about my four year old a little bit, right? And I think about the time that I spend with him doing the the seemingly meaningless things um, of just you know like I spent my day sword fighting him, uh, our evening sword fighting him the other day, and we were I was I was a dragon, but I was still sword fighting. Mm. Just bear with us, but. Um, uh, and those moments allow me, uh, like, you know, earn the right to be heard by me, like in his, in his painful moments when he doesn't understand what's going on. He's like, he's been told no, which is a nuclear bomb going off in his poor little to- toddler brain. Um, that's, that, that's an example of bu- mm-hmm. building that forward. Um, but then you have like in the letter and I'm, I want to read a few of these things of, like say that you have you do have the relationship, mm-hmm. um, and you you aren't just responding to this crisis because because it can it can very easily come across as you know like if a parent is looking to intervene in a child's life who's considering transgenderism, 
of uh, well, they're just worried about how this is going to look on them and their own pride and mm. all of these different things, which is a which is in its own which is its own thing. But I just wanted to read a few of these questions that like can help parents understand um, their their children a little bit better that you have written in here. Um, so one, the first one is like, in what way do you feel like? the opposite gender or both genders or no gender or when is the earliest time you remember feeling this way? Are there situations that you feel this desire stronger? Uh, are there situations where the pain of the struggle lessens? How does your faith influence your thinking in this topic? Are you considering your faith in that topic? And I think that this, those few questions like just show that they care mm -hmm. and are interested in like, what does this mean for you? Um, which I think is, uh, which is really important. Um, so where else, um, so that's like, I think a really great thing with parents. Um, but what about to, with Catholics at large? Like what is, what are some of the main things that I think you speak, you speak to them specifically in the letter? Like, what do you want to, what do you want your average Catholic that's in a pew in your diocese to know about this? Well, I think there's, I think we want to avoid certain extremes of, of reactions to, to this, uh, totally like writing it off, being dismissive of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we need to um, engage creatively and attentively uh, with, with um, around a topic such as this. Um, take it seriously. People are, are really, uh, experiencing this they're really struggling and suffering with this and i think we need to be uh, respectful of that of that reality mm -hmm. um uh, don't um, i'd say don't don't minimize the struggle the suffering uh don't be dismissive of it but at the same time at the same time we can't surrender uh, the truth claims that we we hold uh that we have received uh, about the nature of the human person and uh, we don't want to submit to the to the father of lies and become uh, uh, unwitting instruments of furthering that deception that makes sense there's there is a quote from pope benedict in here i'm going to find it that i think is um is really clear when discussing like if we're inclined to a, a permissive gender affirming responses to some of these things and wanting to like make some concessions to mm -hmm. it that uh, Pope Benedict said, without truth, charity degenerates uh, into just sentimentality. sentimentality. Yeah. And that it's just, I mean, that's, that's a pretty big, it's like, it's basically saying love just turns into, you know, mushy feeling, mushy feeling, you know, which mm -hmm. is a, uh, a far cry from mm -hmm. what we're called from. Um, and not, and also not even authentic. No. You know, like if I'm just kind of permissive of a thing or someone, I, I, I can do that without making any effort to know them, you know? And mm -hmm. I, I loved your use of the quote. We kind of went coming at it from the other side of St. John Paul II saying that evangelization should be joyful, patient, and progressive. Progressive, yeah. And then Pope Francis saying the pace of this accompaniment must be steady and reassuring, reflecting our closeness and our compassionate gaze. And I think if I were a foreign missionary to some country and I wanted to bring the love of Jesus, I would learn their language. Yeah. I would learn their customs. I would understand what was appropriate and not how this made them feel, you know, and I think we, we have to remind ourselves of the Catholic truth and why. And we also have to learn the full language of the LGBTQ community. We have to learn the full language of trans transgenderism, what parts of this are attractive, what parts of this, you know, align with the feelings that my friend or my daughter or my son has. And we have to help translate the truth of the gospel in a way that can be heard and received mm -hmm. by someone who's lives in this um, community and, and, and yeah. to not learn the language and just be kind of permissive of it. 
mm. would be so unloving. <laughs> it would actually send the opposite message, I think, to my child that like, yeah. okay, like you're kind of the black sheep and I let you around Ugh. as opposed to like, I love you and I want to know everything about you and I want to, I'm on steady pursuit of you, mm -hmm. right? Like, so I would be patient even if it was going nowhere. They need to know that I love them. And always if, my son, always my daughter, right? And if somebody feels that our only interest is in changing their mind Correct. about gender identity, uh, that's not love either. No. Mm -mm. Love has to encompass the entire person and actually we're minimizing the person to just simply their gender identity. identity. Yeah. And we're Absolutely. saying- it has to be, you know, a global concern, like you're saying, for yeah. the person. Um, yeah, and that's one of the real dangers of this ideology is that it it reduces identity to one very narrow uh, and yet very important part of a person's whole self and whole identity. And and, and the danger in our responding yeah. in a really good desire is to only focus on that one aspect mm -hmm. of an entire person's right. life and experience right. uh, instead of you know, offering our love, our friendship, and then inside of that love and that friendship, one place that we show our care is by consistently promoting the truth, whether sometimes that's very actively mm -hmm. or just by quietly not changing the pronouns we use for someone. Or it doesn't always have to be a treatise uh, on mm -hmm. the integrity of the body and the soul, right? It can, it can simply be, you know, Let's keep getting coffee just like we did before you came out this way, you know? I don't, I don't know what all the listeners' experiences are, but my conversion is, and I think many people that I've walked with, came about large in part when someone knew the most fractured part of me intimately and they loved me anyway, mm. right? Like they knew that. They didn't bring that up every time we hung out. <laughs> You know, they, they didn't like, you know, pierce into it with, with a hot, you know, rod or something, but <laughs> they, they, they received me as I was and asked questions around that. But there were all sorts of scandalous amounts of time where they just loved me. <laughs> they just loved me for who I was and they knew all of that about me. And you know what that did? My identity wrapped up in that sin just kind of melted off mm. because of the love that they had for me. Hmm. And so, yeah, we must elevate how great we love. Mm. Yeah. I think that brings us to a close here. Um, again, thanks to Archbishop for taking the time to join us on Red Dirt Catholics and discuss this, um, this great letter. And we just thank you for your pastoral leadership as our shepherd here in Oklahoma City. We hope to see, we hope to see a continued breadth of love and our capacity to love only increase as a result of, uh, of the formation that we received from this letter. Father Krug, thanks for being here um, and being the and being the man that says, hey, you guys should do a podcast about this and, and helping us get the ball rolling quickly on that. James, you're one of my best friends. Love you, brother. Um, where can people, Avery, coming in clutch yet again <laughs> off the camera, uh, where can where can they read it, Avery? Archokc.org slash dash slash pastoral dash letters. First thing on the homepage, and it'll be in the we're gonna include a lot of the resources for this particular thing inside the show notes on the podcast as well. And you can click the link there as well. Awesome. Anyways, this has been Red Red Dirt Catholics. Thanks guys and goodbye. 